My childhood and teen years were dominated by two forces, locked in perpetual competition, Jesus and Darwin. There was no doctrine of non-overlapping magisteria, as Stephen Jay Gould might have preferred. Both personages were utterly irreconcilable with the other, so I was led to believe. Yes, Darwin was obviously a soul-selling shill for the special interests of Hellfire and Brimstone, with Satan's talons firmly gripping his condemned soul. While this sounds familiar to anyone growing up fundy, like many from such an environment, my church had a number of peculiar doctrines to distinguish us from all of you deceived sinners and the rest of churchianity. Central to our belief was the conviction that everyone else was doing Jesus wrong. So away with all the Catholic accretions, which we knew dated back to ancient paganism. Time to get back to the real Jesus. But when you attempt such an endeavor, you find a surprising void in the record of history. Exploring these mysteries has led me to some surprising conclusions. Even now, as a godless champion of faithlessness, one side of my eternal dilemma has revealed insights into the other in a way I would not have thought possible. I succeeded in deprogramming myself from my childhood bubble of creationism but as a result of my church's attempts to break with pagan tradition to get back to the truest Jesus beliefs possible, I'm actually very comfortable with the idea that conventional wisdom on the subject of the greatest man in history might be very, very mistaken. So there are two popular approaches to Jesus research. The gullible fundy school of thought, or, number two, the just some guy hypothesis. As a fundamentalist, you can choose to convince yourself that everything in the Gospels is completely, literally true, even when it contradicts itself. And when rationalists snicker behind your back, you just chalk it up to the wiles of the devil. A more enlightened middle road approach is to consider Jesus as just some guy, a good moral teacher, a radical Jewish preacher who fell a foul of the authorities, but not magical, not a god, not virgin-born. But either method leads us into conundrums. It's been known for a long time that there was no mention of Jesus at all by any surviving writer from the time he allegedly lived. A virgin-born wizard able to walk on water while raising the dead and triggering a posthumous zombie apocalypse, and who is also his own father, now that would raise some eyebrows. Plenty of writers in those days. Well-documented writers. Someone would have noticed something. Plenty of believers continue to claim that the miracles perhaps could have happened, despite the total absence of corroboration. But believing that opens the door to all the other uncorroborated, unevidenced miracle claims. Maybe Dionysus really was born from Zeus's thigh. Maybe Hercules really did kill a snake monster that could sprout new heads. Why not? If you allow one miracle, why not more? The only reason why is because most of us were not indoctrinated as children to believe in Zeus or Hercules. To the uncritical mind, it's enough to believe that you were lucky enough to be born into the right religion because mommy and daddy said so. Most will never bother to question the cultural cage of their childhood upbringing. But through the centuries, some scholars did have the courage to ask tougher questions, and most of this series will address the second, more serious hypothesis. There was just some guy, and his followers told stories about him. A man, a preacher, a firebrand, a Jew who challenged the authorities of his day, gained fame, some followers, claimed a connection with the divine, and was killed. Who was this man really? He could only be Honi Hamagel. What? You thought I was going to say Jesus, didn't you? Well, those claims come much later, more than a century later. 
a fatal flaw in attempts to demonstrate how Jesus legends began is the fact that we actually have another example of a Jewish mystic with followers who made supernatural claims about him. Choni the circle drawer was a first century BCE rainmaker who criticized the powerful factions of his time and was stoned to death according to Josephus. Yet a rabbinic legend says that he actually fell into a deep sleep for 70 years, after which no one would believe his identity. Then, upon praying, God took him up into heaven, according to the Talmud. Honi's claim to fame was a consequence of drought. He would draw his eponymous circle in the dirt, stand inside and proclaim to God that he would not leave the circle until rain came. And it seemed to work. People believed in a connection between his divine hunger strikes and the necessary precipitation. He was captured during the fighting between two brothers of the Hasmonean dynasty and ordered to pray for the success of one of the factions. Seeing both as corrupt, he instead prayed that God would deny the prayers of both sides. For which he was stoned to death, according to Josephus, in the Antiquities of the Jews. Conflicting legends report that he really did not die from stoning, but slept for 70 years. Here we have all the required ingredients. A godly Jew who cares about the law and the people. He is killed by powerful men for denouncing their corruption. And after dying, his followers made supernatural claims that he wasn't really dead. Sounds familiar. If that's all it takes, then the architecture around where I live would be very different. But today, steeples in the Midwest don't have circles on them, and my loving parents aren't wringing their hands, wondering why their son isn't a Honian, or Honiest, or Magellian. He did not start up a string of cults, despite supernatural claims made about him even though he was more famous than Jesus because he actually got mentioned by a historian. Jesus is included in writings attributed to Josephus, but it's well known that these are forgeries or accidental interpolations. But there's nothing suspicious about Josephus's reference of this figure. He made the cut of real history without later writers committing fraud to insert him in. Moreover, he is also mentioned in the Jewish Talmud, multiple attestations. So it's fair to say that the circle drawer was more famous than Jesus, preceded Jesus, and also had followers making claims of heavenly exaltation whereby the prophet escaped death. So why wasn't Honi worshipped as a demigod? Most likely because everyone knew he was just a man. Jews simply don't worship men as being equal to God. This example makes the case of Jesus even more peculiar. More complicated for the hypothesis of Jesus as just some guy are all the other failed loser messiahs mentioned by Josephus in the Jewish War and Jewish Antiquities. He mentioned a pair of Judases, Simon of Perea, Athronges the shepherd, Thutis, the son of one of the Judases, and several others that made grand claims, but died without effecting change. If Jesus was, in truth, just some ordinary preacher that got killed, what made him special? Why him? Why were none of these Jewish rebels exalted as heavenly beings? Why aren't 70% of the American people Simonians or Athrongians today? Why aren't our parents desperately praying that their children get right with Thutis? Well, obviously, because they were just normal men. Here, the fundamentalist has a ready answer. Those others weren't worshipped as God because they couldn't do miracles like Jesus did. Signs and wonders. So... Jesus plastered the countryside with miracles that defy everything we know about reality, miracles enough to draw crowds in the thousands, got the Jews to break their own laws by killing a prisoner on a high holy day, caused the sun to darken at his death, 
to say nothing of the tombs opening up in Jerusalem like a first century rendition of Thriller, yet somehow no one saw fit to write any of this down or leave any artifacts. As the Brits would say, not bloody likely. Another argument against taking the Gospel's word for it is the principle of contamination by philosopher Stephen Law. Basically, the idea is that if an author feels free to invent a zombie apocalypse and magical darkness at high noon, he would have no problem inventing mundane things, like whatever Jesus' last words were. Depends on which gospel you read. Apologists Robert Gregg Cavan and Carlos Columbetti have written a response to law, but in it, they make assumptions based on the reliability of the text. They assume, in part that the disciples wouldn't have died for a lie. Aside from the fact that plenty of people die for phony religious beliefs, we don't really know for sure that the disciples existed either. Paul corroborates three of them, the pillars of the church, but we don't seem to have any record in secular history of twelve great advocates for a crucified Galilean preacher. Which is weird, because their whole purpose was to go out and get noticed but no one seems to have noticed them except their own sect, and then only three of that group. The idea of twelve preaching disciples appears to be just as legendary as the lukewarm stroll across the Sea of Galilee. All it would take to seal the case for the historic Jesus would be a scrap of parchment dating to the right time saying, Hey, I met that Jesus of Nazareth fella. Or maybe, hey, I met that Bartholomew guy. He told me all about Jesus of Nazareth. He is totally the straight dope. But that's all it would take. And of course, no such document or scrap of a document exists. Without external corroboration, the only evidence that needs to be explained is the existence of a myth. And ancient people invented myths of virgin-born godmen all the time. Yet no one could be bothered to write down these incredible occurrences while they were supposedly occurring. One excuse I've heard from apologists is that paper was just so expensive back then that no one could afford to write it down or hire a scribe to do so. But again, we have many writings from those times on mundane topics. Josephus was able to pony up for the paper to write about less interesting failures but not the most important of all? How strange. But the story of Jesus and the legend of the Messiah change over time. By studying these changes in the next installment, we'll find surprising clues that let us trace back the phylogeny of Christianity to an accidental beginning.